my favorite psalms, and I love the poem also by David Wagner, that reminder that no matter where I find myself, there is always a place for me in the heart of God. No matter how lost I may be, God never stops revealing God's self to me in ways that I can see. And no matter how far I may wander from God, the world around me is an amazing witness to God's amazing power and grace. And if I just stand still for a while, soaking in creation and waiting, I will be able to reconnect with my creator in new and a new and beautiful way, which gives meaning to those moments I find myself lost in the dark wood. Many of you might remember a very popular movie a few years ago, Bruce Almighty, where Bruce finds himself on the edge of the dark wood, though I'm guessing he never read either Eric Elness or David Wagner. Bruce is far from his place in the world and feeling desperate for a sign that his life has purpose and matters for something after he's been fired from his job as a TV um, weatherman. So as he drives down the highway one night, he decides that he is lost and he is going to try praying. Let's watch together. Okay, God, you want me to talk to you? Tell him back. Tell me what's going on. What should I do? Give me a signal. Smart, please send me a sign. Oh, what's this joker doing now? Okay. All right. I'll try it your way. All right. Lord, I need a miracle. I'm desperate. I need your help, Lord. Please. Reach into my life. Uh, what the? Are you? I got you. Sorry, don't know you. I wouldn't call you if I did. Any of you ever felt like Bruce? Like, my gosh, I have been praying, I have been doing everything I can, and God, you have just fallen down on the job. Well, in this particular scene, we see, as the people watching, God's very obvious and blatant response to Bruce, who doesn't see it. And while we might not think that God is quite obvious as this all of the time, we would really be mistaken if we thought that God doesn't respond to our pleas for help when we're lost in whatever dark wood we find ourselves. But unfortunately, this scene represents the very real pain 
and desperation of countless people who are lost in the dark, even as it can remind us that we often overlook the signals that God sends to us. You see, our world is full today of people who truly believe that there is either no God or that God simply does not care about them. While at the same time, those same people recount incidents and coincidences that have happened in their lives, which we, as people of faith, would point to as the Spirit's direction. But people, and that includes us sometimes, often think of praying to God, of hearing God's voice, of receiving answers to prayers as a request for some sort of supernatural response, like a check for just what we need to make ends meet arriving in the mail, or several zeros automatically being added to our bank account balance. But just as God has from the very beginning, God still continues to prefer natural laws to supernatural intervention, often directing people who are in need while maintaining and respecting free will and the constraints of natural law, even as God reaches out to us with gentle intuitions to our consciousness that frankly we can choose to listen to or not. When we truly begin looking for people, um, looking for God in the people and the experiences that are all around us, we will find them and we will begin to see God's spirit at work everywhere we look. You see, the world in which we live, it's not just earth and sky and plants and animals. There's something going on in all that mix that adds up to so much more. Every great religion has been formed and continued by those who have connected somehow with that something and wanted to know more. But it's so easy for us to get caught up in our day-to-day busyness that we lose sense of the wonder and awe that simply living in our universe provides. Because there is a realm of the Spirit. Jesus calls it the kingdom of God, and it infuses our world. And making contact with that Spirit is the key to the gift of getting lost. Now, the ancient Israelites, they understood this in a very real way, recognizing that it's often hard to interpret what's going on in our world. So there are stories in Hebrew scriptures about dreams and about interpretation of dreams and visions and encounters with angels and so much more. In our scene from Bruce Almighty, Bruce stays lost not because somehow he has failed in the way that he asks God for help, but because he has failed to listen from his heart. He expects supernatural answers like the one seen in the movies where the clouds part and the beam of sunlight comes down and illuminates the hero's face. And then he or she hears a booming voice from above. Or in Bruce's words, God, I need a miracle. Now, Eric Elness, in his book, Gifts of the Darkwood, writes, if an Israelite prophet were to offer advice to Bruce, I can imagine him saying, let God be God, not a movie version of God. And if you misinterpret the signals God sends, trust me, they'll keep coming. If only you'll watch and listen with as much soulfulness as you've invested in crying out to God. And that's the basis for our scripture story from Samuel today. Samuel arrives into the scene, onto the scene in a peculiar time and a peculiar way. At that time, Israel was a mesh of tribal city-states led by clan leadership. And they have devolved more and more as they've integrated with those already living in the promised land. So in Judges, we read, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And the reason that things are out of control, we're given to believe, 
is because there is no king in Israel. And as a result, we see this religious lethargy that have left this particular time devoid of any divine animation or sense of divine presence. And we read, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. I often wonder if that same thing might not be written about the times that we're living in as well. Well, Samuel is born into those tumultuous times, just as you and I are born into these times today. He was the child that was longed for by his mother in order for her to feel a sense of blessedness. A wife among wives, she was the barren one. And in the ancient world, a closed womb um, was cause for grief. And Hannah, Samuel's mother, had much sorrow, so much so that when she went to the temple to pray for a child, she had so much fervor and passion that the priest, Eli, actually thought she was in the temple drunk. But when Samuel was born, that birth made her sing. And she sang a prophetic song that leads me to believe that she was as much of a prophet in her own right as Samuel would become for Israel. His birth song was revolutionary. We see it echoed again in Mary's Magnificat when she finds out she's about to give birth to the Savior. And though she had asked God so passionately for that son, she also listened to an internal prompting that said, he belonged to the nation state and to God. And so after being weaned, we discover that Hannah actually takes this much beloved, much sought for son of Samuel and leaves him with the priest Eli to be brought up in surface to the temple. So Samuel's call story does not begin with the call and the voice from God nor Eli's promptings, but rather with his mother who trained him and suckled him and prayed for him, who sang over him, who weaned him so that he would be free to learn how to minister to God. So this prequel to Samuel's call ought to be considered perhaps as we ponder our own place in the world because God knows us and God calls us from the minute we are conceived. And Samuel was known and knew God before he ever entered into the world just like we have also been known our whole lives. And we've been brought before God through a series of special relationships. If not our parents or our families, along the way, pastors, friends, youth leaders, strangers have shepherded, shepherded and nurtured us into a place where we may hear God's call and have a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. And that is the God who wishes to guide us through our times of lostness. So who have those people been for us? Who have been the Hannahs in our lives? As today's story goes, Samuel is a temple apprentice to Eli, who's a temple priest. And one night, he's sleeping on the floor of the sanctuary. It sounds like the ultimate lock-in, right? Yeah. Um, and so he hears a voice calling to him, Samuel! Samuel, and thinking the voice to be that of Eli, which how many of us would have thought that? I'm thinking. All right, I confess. The rest of you are more faithful than I am. But thinking that that voice was Eli's voice, Samuel goes into him and asks him what he wants. Eli tells him, I don't want anything. The voice isn't mine, and sends Samuel back to bed. Well, it happens three times that way, and finally, Eli suspects that something is up. So he instructs Samuel to lie back down and to respond should he hear the voice again with the wee words, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Well, Samuel goes back, does what he's told, lies down, and does hear his, the voice calling his name once more, and he responds, Speak, for your servant is listening. And with a heart ready to listen, Samuel receives a message that moves him from being a temple apprentice to being Israel's greatest prophet, 
since Moses. He finds his place in the world as he learns to listen to God. How do you learn <laughs> to respond as Samuel did? Finding your place in the world and learning to discern the whispers of the Holy Spirit, not only in those times when you're lost, but every single day. There are a few cues, clues in Samuel's story that will help us learn maybe a little bit about the character and nature of God and how to walk in that spirit who guides us along the path. First, God acts in ways that are much more subtle than pagers and signs flashing in our face. As we learned last week, rarely would a Hebrew equate the voice of God with any sort of audible sound. They knew that signals were much more subtle. So think for a minute of what, it, what it's like when you try to let someone know that you're interested in them. Now, back in the day when I was in high school, I remember you would like hang out by their locker. When, uh -huh. um, or maybe you look at them a certain way. Or you laugh at jokes that really aren't funny. Or maybe, maybe you touch them lightly on their arm. But you give out clues to let them know. Well, now, some of us get those clues. Others of us are really obtuse. And how many times have we had to have a friend say, you know, he or she really likes you. Oh, no. Duh, I was begging for your attention. And we're like, oh, I didn't see it. So, you know, people aren't literally begging for us or whatever, but, but the clues are there. Well, we even notice that Samuel has his doubts because he actually leaves out the word, word Lord in his response. Remember, Eli tells him to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Samuel just responds, speak, your servant is listening, right? But not quite sure about all that, but willing to give it a benefit of the doubt. But so his heart is open and God speaks, even though he leaves out the direct address. And God does the same for us. But too often we miss the clues. We miss out on the wonderful things because we're expecting to God, God to respond with more supernatural effects than God is wont to do. Now, the second clue for us in Samuel's story is that this voice came to him while he was alone in the quietness of night. And finding alone time to listen to God is absolutely essential for our spiritual journey. Every morning, I try to find a minimum of 30 minutes for time alone with God. And when I'm particularly busy, I discover that I need even more alone time with God. But starting my day with that kind of centering leaves me open the rest of the day for listening to the whispers from God that come in so many ways. From all of you, God has spoken to my heart. From the beautiful place in which we live, I gain strength from its beauty, from its sometimes emptiness, from gentle rains that fall. God's direction for me comes from many, many different forms. And for that, I am profoundly grateful. The third clue is that it takes Samuel four times to finally be ready to hear God's message. The Spirit doesn't stop sending us signals just because we don't understand the first time or even if we have doubts or we're not ready to hear whatever it might be at that particular moment. And it's also a reminder that just because we think we're on the right track, we should proceed somewhat cautiously being sure to ask the Spirit all along the way for continued guidance and direction because the paths that we discover when we're lost are rarely straight or obvious. And it isn't helpful always to simply charge forward thinking that we know the way just because we have found one marker. Because there are many hikers who have lost his or her way because they've quit paying attention to the markers on the trail and get headed in the wrong direction by just making one wrong turn. And the final insight or clue that we get from Samuel's story is that his instruction came from Eli 
a very imperfect person who made lots of mistakes in his life and ministry. And yet God still used him in a powerful way to guiding Samuel toward his calling as a prophet and seer. So wisdom and guidance can come when we least expect it from people that we might never think of as a wise advisor or a role model. And that reminds us that we too might just be God's voice or nudging to someone else. Because maybe we've experienced something in our lives that can be an answer to that cry for help. In the dark wood, even those who are lost themselves can be gift bearers to others seeking their way in the dark. Because maybe we've experienced something in our lives that can be an answer to that cry for help. In the dark wood, even those who are lost themselves can be gift bearers to others seeking their way in the dark. Each week during Lent, we're given a time to reflect following the sermon. A precious time that we often don't allow ourselves, and that time is always accompanied by music. This week, you are invited to think of a word of encouragement that you might give to someone you might, who might cross the path where you have been. Someone who maybe is lost in the same way you have been lost at some point in your life. What would you say to them? What, what might God have you say to them? For those who actually like to um, act instead of just reflect, there are markers that I have left, permanent Sharpie markers, out by the entryway to the labyrinth, which is just behind the patio um, by the fellowship hall. You can pick up a rock from the ground just outside the labyrinth. Don't use one of the ones that are lining the labyrinth. Um, there are plenty of rocks out there. And write your word of encouragement on a rock. Lock it into the center of the labyrinth, and there's a big stone cross there. Um, and leave your word, your rock, on top of that cross for someone else who might be walking the labyrinth in the, the rest of the time during Lent or during this whole year. Um, that word might just be what someone is looking for in their time of prayer and reflection. In addition, it's my prayer that God will put someone in your path this week who needs your word of encouragement, your smile, your interest in them, a moment that just might help them out of their place of lostness. So I invite us into a time of reflection, using this time in any way that's meaningful to you. <laughs> 